So uh, today is a very, very happy day. I hope my slides are working. <laughs> um, it's a very special day. Home to the place of origin of humankind and home to the place of origin of mathematics and science. So look at this stone. Uh, it's, uh, it was carved 70,000 years ago in the Blombos Cave on the southern coast of Africa. The markings on it are remarkably similar to the wall over there. Um, and even to the NEF logo. And you see that people 70,000 years ago were playing with geometrical ideas here in Africa. Of course, we've already seen uh, this amazing uh, artifact, human artifact. It's the uh, leg bone of a baboon, and it has been notched with uh, all of the prime numbers less than 20. And the notches on one side add up to 60, exactly. And the other side also add up to 60, but in a different combination of numbers. And it's clear that in the Congo, in fact, uh, in Goma, uh, in, the, in the region which is the Virunga National Park currently, somebody was playing with numbers uh, 20,000 years ago. So just think of where that play led, the play with mathematics, the play with numbers. Of course, it underlies every single modern technology and every way in which society functions today. Maths is the root of it all. Now, I'm a cosmologist, so I care about everything. Okay, I care about the universe, and uh, this is, if you like, the ultimate fruition of mathematical thinking. We have been able to comprehend and explain an enormous amount about the entire universe. So this picture shows us the solar system at the center, and then as we move outwards, we go backwards in time, because as we look out, we're seeing light coming to us from long ago. And when we reach the distant edges of what we can see, 14 billion light years away, we see the emergence of galaxies and structure in the universe. And so the red ring there is the edge of the hot Big Bang. It's the region which released the radiation which is only now reaching us. And if we even go further to the gray ring, the edge of that ring is the Big Bang itself. And of course, that is the goal of the kind of science I do, is to understand what banged. Uh, the biggest question in science. Well, mathematics has taken us very far to understanding those things. And I want to tell you about this great discovery of gravitational waves. Waves fundamental mathematical concept underlying much of modern physics. Sound is a wave. Light is a wave. Uh, even particles move according to quantum theory as waves in space. And waves we're all familiar with, like uh, the waves caused by drops of rain. And uh, we're not so familiar with the waves caused by gravity. So, of course, we're looking for the next Einstein. We should celebrate the first Einstein. And President Kagame reminded me yesterday, uh, the first Einstein was also an African, because, of course, we're all African. <laughs> so let's celebrate 
uh, the first Einstein while looking forward to the next one. And uh, what Einstein did 100 years ago was to understand how gravity works. That gravity is not a force extended by a rope or uh, some uh, physical object. Gravity is just the bending of space and time. And that's why all objects fall the same under gravity, because we're all moving in the same arena uh, of space and time. So the sun bends space like this ball in the picture, and that bending causes the Earth and the planets to be attracted to the sun and revolve around it. Well, as soon as you imagine bending space, you wonder maybe those distortions of space can travel. Uh, and, may, and that's what a gravitational wave is. And then, incredibly, 100 years after Einstein had this conception, uh, we developed the capability to test it. Einstein himself thought this was so difficult it would never be done. Because in, at the time he discovered his theory in 1915, this seemed to be ridiculous. To measure an effect so tiny, uh, it defied all belief. So here's the experiment that did it, LIGO. It's like a four kilometer antenna. It has two arms, four kilometers long each. And this antenna faces uh, the sky, and it's looking for this tiny signal. Now, Joseph uh, Benjaloon already mentioned how weak uh, gravitational waves are. I want to give you some picture of this. Imagine that four kilometer arm is really the distance from the Earth to the sun. Okay, so just scale it up all the way to the sun. And then ask how much does a gravitational wave change this length from the Earth to the sun? The answer is by the size of one atom. Okay, one ten billionth of a meter. That's the sensitivity this instrument had to possess in order to detect this very, very faint gravitational wave. But detected it did uh, in a most spectacular announcement less than a month ago. It sends shivers down your spine to see uh, the result. It fits perfectly to theory. Uh, it was, the signal is unambiguous. There's nothing you can adjust to, uh, in the theory to fit. And uh, here it's what it shows us. 1.3 billion light years away from us. These two black holes shown above were orbiting each other. The distortion of space-time is shown below. They were distorting space and time and sending out waves. As they approach, uh, the movie is slowed so you can see it. They approached and then these two black holes merge into one. And the single black hole is left. Some ripples in space-time travel outwards. And that was detected by the LIGO observatory. The whole effect is less than three-tenths of a second, but the signal is absolutely perfect fit. And it tells us these two black holes had a mass of around 30 times the mass of the sun. And the total energy released in gravitational waves was equal to three times the mass, the energy contained in our sun. It all came out in three-tenths of a second, and it was so powerful, that's why it could travel over a billion light years to us. So I look at this and I think, wow, what can human beings do? 100 years ago, this seemed to be impossible. People only tried 50 years ago. They only they started to try. Eventually, it took people 50 years, a team of over 1,000 scientists working together from all over the world achieved this impossible uh, discovery. It, if we can do this, what can we not do? It's simply uh, mind-blowing. 
Well, what comes next? When you can see gravitational waves, you can do something even more amazing than seeing black holes. You can see what happened at the Big Bang. So here's a picture of the history of the universe. As uh, Joseph showed, we don't know what happened at the Big Bang. Where did everything come from? It came from this mysterious event, and we're trying to figure out what, what happened. What is happening today? The universe today is full of dark energy, which is 70% of everything, and dark matter, which is 25% of all the energy in the universe, and we don't know what that is. It's a profound and wonderful mystery. These are the challenges which a next Einstein must solve. And I was in physics. There are plenty of other challenges, but in physics, these are the challenges. I was delighted to learn at this meeting that one of the Ames graduates is at DAISY in Germany, uh, working on dark matter detection experiments. So many Ames graduates become interested in these uh, wonderful questions. And of course, Africa will soon be the home of the largest telescope in the world, a square kilometer array, and this will enable us to discover more wonderful facts about the universe. So as well as talking about a very big and remote phenomena, I want to talk a little bit about quantum. The word has come up a few places, and uh, I think people haven't really uh, absorbed the fact that a revolution is coming. A te technological revolution is on the way. Because we are now able to manipulate the quantum world with a similar accuracy that we were able to manipulate the classical world. Here, this picture shows an array of atoms, and you can access the individual atoms with lasers and control their states. And when you deal with atoms, you're dealing with quantum. Forget your mental picture of an atomic nucleus with electrons going around. No, it's really quantum, and that is a very oversimplified picture of what's happening. You see, in quantum theory, particles, like the electrons in an atom, are actually waves. They're both waves and particles, and I call them possibility waves. Why? Because every particle is actually everywhere at once. It doesn't have a single position, and this experiment, the famous double slit experiment, shows the passage of light through two slits, and the pattern, much like the interference of waves, actually collapses into particles at the screen. These are photons, particles of light. So the quantum world is infinitely richer and more wonderful than our mental conception of reality. And this is now becoming uh, a route to new technologies. So this object in the middle is a qubit, a quantum bit. Uh, we all talk about the digital revolution, okay? It makes me laugh because uh, that's not how nature works, okay? Nature is not digital. It doesn't work in zeros and ones. Nature is quantum. If something could be zero and one, it could also be any combination. In quantum theory, every object explores all of its possible states all the time. In fact, the simplest thing in nature, quantum mechanically, is one of these qubits. And its states comprise a sphere. That pointer on the sphere indicates the state. And so even the simplest thing in nature has an infinity of states. And when you combine many of them, there are infinity times infinity times infinity of states. And when we speak about creating a quantum computer, it will vastly exceed anything which any classical computer could ever do. So this is what's coming. Uh, it's around the corner. I wish I could tell you more, but uh, we want, uh, that's why we're calling the new research center in Rwanda, Quantum Leap Africa. We want to prepare Africa for this coming quantum revolution in technology. So many wonderful things are happening in science. Uh, I wish I could talk about some of them, but I have no time. 
whether it is missions to Mars, new types of batteries, artificial intelligence, proteomics, uh, quantum communicators, there are incredible new things happening in technology, so much so we can't anticipate where the world is going. All we can say is it will be very different. 25 years from now, the world will be unrecognizable. How does this fit into the, to Ames and the next Einstein Forum? Well, science is the most pre precious possession of humankind. There's no question about that. It's also remarkable because it's free. Science is knowledge, knowledge can be shared. But science has often been used uh, for bad purposes, to make weapons, to uh, create companies which, uh, which exploit people because they're so powerful. Science has been used to grow inequality in the world. What, why is it significant to bring science to Africa? Because science itself will be transformed. Because the kind of young scientists who enter science from Africa will come from disadvantaged cultures and peoples, just like Einstein was a Jew and came from a disadvantaged uh, uh, culture, excluded from university in the 19th century. Uh, Einstein had a point to prove. When new cultures enter, especially from disadvantaged people, they transform the field, and that's what can happen. So I see Africa's contribution to science as potentially transformative, to bring people in, new set of people in, who are motivated, you notice the NEF talks, uh, two of them were strongly motivated by the desire to improve the condition of their people. And the third one was strongly motivated by the desire to do the best science here. Um, and uh, I believe the entrance of young Africans in large numbers into science will transform science for the better. In that same cave where the uh, stone, the ochre stone was etched, there were these wonderful paintings. You see, our forebears in Africa connected science to art and uh, to our nature as human beings. And I think we need to recover that connection. We need scientists to see themselves not as technicians, but as humans, as part of society, motivated by improving uh, the condition of humankind. Of course, Africa created probably the greatest leader of the 20th century, Nelson Mandela. And Africa's given the world so much else in music, in art, in, in sports people, uh, in, in film stars. Uh, all of these fields, Africa has distinguished it itself. What is it going to do? Can you imagine a Mandela for science? Can you imagine an African Einstein who combined the brilliance of Einstein with the compassion and intelligence of Mandela. That's what we want. And that's what they'll look like. <laughs> Ames and the next Einstein Forum, the goal, the objective is to create a generation of brilliant African scientists to care for their continent, to care for the planet, to show the world that science can be used to improve the condition of everyone. Thank you very much.